transparency. Transparency. Whether revealed through difficulty options, mechanic or moveset descriptions, UI, feedback, or controls, a game's information should be discernible and intelligible. Games that embrace transparency and clarity in their rules and mechanics are defined by the aphorism easy to learn, difficult to master. For players to engage with the game, it's imperative they grasp a fundamental understanding. The player should be curious and driven to master a game through the depth of its mechanics and by a seamless and intuitive learning process, all of which culminates in satisfying experimentation and total proficiency. Unfortunately, the lack of transparency can obstruct the learning process, or best case scenario, induce an obtuse and frustrating experience. Often, games are transparent through carefully worded descriptions or text, such as the roguelite Nova Drift. In Nova Drift, you improve your character through irrevocable upgrades called gears in the first three levels and one mod per level thereafter. The gears and mods often possess tangible negative effects or costs to balance out the positive or benefits. Therefore, it's important for Nova Drift to clarify the effects so players can measure the risks, costs, and benefits of a mod. For example, the Radiant Shields mod provides a shield benefit and two downsides. Most of the time, I don't equip Radiant Shields because the inconsequential benefit isn't worth the two noticeable shield downgrades. However, if I grab the Shield Halo or Shield Temporal gear, for instance, I now want Radiant Shields, but only because we understand the pros and cons of the mod. The explicitly stated plus 40% on the shield radius and 10% on the cost convey certain expectations, so I can focus on weighing my options and experimenting with the mechanics and different mod combinations. On the other hand, if I equip mods like Volatile Shields and Flash Shielding, I now regard the 10% slower shield cooldown from Radiant Shields as too detrimental of a cost to consider. You view 10% as positive, negligible, or dreadful depending on the context or the other mods you choose, but you're only able to make these decisions because of Nova Drift's transparency. The more the player is confused by the mechanics, the less likely they will invest the time to learn the mechanics which is necessary to achieve mastery. What if the description for Radiant Shields read an increase in shield radius and a minor decrease in maximum shields? Such a vague description prohibits the player from grasping the true effect of the mod. The word minor could arbitrarily range from 1% to 30%, so we spend more time on experiments or trial and error to decipher the effects of the mod than on actual risk-reward decision making. Mods like Focus Fire may not contain costs or downsides on their own, but their value is defined by what other mods lack. The projectile spread from upgrades adds up pretty quickly, which can be detrimental when fighting lone enemies from a safe distance like bosses, so you may want to consider Focus Fire. Even though we don't weigh the negative options of Focus Fire since it has none, the player should understand Focus Fire's value and the opportunity cost of taking the perk over other mods. Otherwise, we may take Focus Fire for a vague projectile spread improvement without understanding the overall significance of our decisions or why or when we should bother with certain mods. However, Nova Drift isn't always transparent. The weapon railgun gear, for instance, states that damage scales with projectile velocity. Normally, damage scales with damage, so the player can interpret this statement in two different ways. Damage only scales with projectile velocity, or damage also scales with projectile velocity. One word is all it takes to clarify a possible misunderstanding. A couple mods lack a proper time statistic. The Body Spectre gear provides a plus 200% damage bonus that rapidly diminishes upon firing or moving quickly. Rapidly diminish is vague and meaningless. It's a bit difficult to grasp Spectre's value when we don't understand the duration of the damage buff in seconds. The Warpath mod suffers from the same issue. The player cannot judge its value unless the unknown time factor is defined. One number can make all the difference. Furthermore, the Snipe mod doesn't state the damage bonus, so it could be garbage for all I know. Yet, Incendiary Strike defines both the damage and duration, so I can comfortably and informatively consider and experiment with Incendiary Strike without looming questions or concerns about its function. 
The targeting mod is also difficult to judge, so the player chooses it in the hope that it amounts to something useful. And this becomes a significant issue when the future projectile targeting mods, guidance, and convergence enter the picture with hefty downsides. How do I know if the projectile targeting is potent enough to warrant the costs? Especially since not even the mods' images competently showcase the significance of the homing effect. Though Nova Drift's images greatly help to mitigate possible visual gaps in understanding that a description may create, the magnitude of an effect like projectile targeting can only be properly understood if visualized beyond a conceptual image. For instance, Hyperlight Drifter relies entirely on visual storytelling and the skill purchases are no exception. Instead of descriptions or images attached to the upgrades or new skills, Hyperlight Drifter exemplifies transparency through video demonstrations. The videos demonstrate and visualize exactly what the player should expect. The game deals more in absolutes than Nova Drift, with deliberate decisive attacks, simple health bars, and streamlined damage integers to match the health bars and chunky weapon feedback. Information like percent damage and percent healing would overcomplicate the game. Hyperlight Drifter's video demonstrations facilitate a natural learning curve, so the learning blends in with the mastery. The new ability or skill is easy to learn exactly how it works, and difficult to master in every ideal scenario and enemy combination in conjunction with every other player skill and attack. Games should also stress transparency in consequences. Into the Breach conveys the consequences of your actions by exhibiting how your potential move will influence the battlefield before you lock in your decision. If a player's lapse in memory or understanding of a mechanic or rule results in an unforeseen and adverse consequence, then the player may feel frustrated and won't want to continue playing the game, even if it's not the game's fault. Into the Breach clarifies the player's potential actions and their consequences so the player can focus entirely on the strategy. The game should stress that the player's consequences are their fault and in their control so they yearn to improve instead of quit. In further service of this, Into the Breach recognizes human error and thus allows the player to undo the last move or, once per match, reset the current turn. And honestly, without the gracious yet restrictive undo and reset features, you may forsake the game to your backlog sooner than later, especially in a game with permanent consequences. Transparency and consequences extends to the common highlight target feature found in tactical RPGs like Divinity Original Sin 2. Your skills highlight the target or targets to set player expectations. Players concentrate on which skill to use when and where and the strategy they're in without feeling frustrated from skills missing their targets that should have hit. Unfortunately, Divinity 2 fails to consistently follow through on target highlight expectations, and one broken promise is all it takes to screw over a now frustrated player. Transparency should also manifest in controls. The player can't even begin the learning process if they're unaware of the controls or the button mappings. You might want to heal. How do I? You are kind of damaged. It hasn't told me how to do that yet. Hold on, I want to. The mysterious classified controls and their corresponding actions might as well not exist, especially for new players unfamiliar with the type or category of game and the associated common game mechanics. Why didn't the game tell me about this? This seems a little important. This, this seems a little useful. I could have. I could have used that. Mario Odyssey's action guide, for instance, doesn't contain some of Mario's controls, so even though the Cheap Cheap can dash, the player would never know of its existence, except maybe by accident or by consulting a third party source. Abzu suffers from the same issue. It's frankly a miracle that I stumbled across the Triple Boost, a non trivial speed boost that significantly increased my enjoyment of the game. If non-transparent controls is the guard that prevents you from venturing into the game beyond, then unintuitive controls is the wall that you laboriously climb over only to fall into the ocean. Have you ever tried to grasp water with your hands? Also while drowning? It's very difficult.
Intuitive controls allow players to grasp and understand otherwise harsh or obtuse learning curves and blend the learning and mastery together into one cohesive experience. Intuitive controls also reciprocate players' intentions, so whatever the player wants to do is expressed through the character. Mechanics are more difficult to learn and eventually master if the controls require conscious effort to input or remember. Controls should be both transparent and intuitive. For example, I had in time intuitively maps the dive action to a single button, but Mario Odyssey unintuitively maps the dive to two unrelated buttons that must be pressed in a certain sequence. Ground pound, then cappy throw. I'm surprised actually, I expected the dive to activate from ground pound plus cappy throw plus crouch plus long jump plus roll plus the Konami code. Consequently, the dive's learning curve is more complex without additional depth. Players more likely than not input the dive out of necessity and then forget about it rather than for the fun of it. Furthermore, if you want to dive to reach a platform but fumble the input, then Mario ground pounds and misses the platform completely, which is frustrating because that's the exact opposite of your intention. If you want to ground pound then throw Cappy to capture a creature, too bad. Instead of capturing the creature, you frustratingly ram your face into it and take damage because of the unintuitive controls. What should be an intuitive action responds with a completely different action. Moreover, Mario's popular Cappy into Dive combination is more of a memorized pattern than an intuitive string of inputs. Mario's Cappy into Dive combo is not transparent, but that's because the player should discover this string of inputs naturally through the associated mechanics and what is supposed to be intuitive, transparent controls. A hat in time and Mario Odyssey's dives are the same action, but recontextualized under different controls. The biggest blunder in overall transparency that I've possibly ever played falls to the game Indivisible. Indivisible's character level system is unclear and perplexing. For example, Ajna's level doesn't only affect her, but the entire team. But you'd never guess that since visually the player's level is specifically next to Ajna and the other characters have their own separate levels. We can glean that the teammates' hearts represent affinity toward Ajna, but do they affect the game at all? I'm still unsure, but the hearts may affect each character's individual strength as a hidden multiplier. Moreover, the affinities are misleading because a character who starts with a negative affinity, like Dar, is equivalent to a standard character who starts with a positive affinity. The game never explains this level or affinity system, so we may assume Dar is underpowered, or may completely drop certain characters from the team before they gain affinity, thinking they deal little damage. In Indivisible, most characters are capable of three super powerful abilities I'll call supers that cost differing amounts of itty. Indivisible doesn't explain most of the characters as supers and most don't require user input. So what happens when some of them require user input without any indication whatsoever? Something like this compared to the intended result. Or how about this? Compared to... The player discovers the supers' intended execution from trial and error. The game needs to clarify individual supers within each character's moveset or guide. The player is much more engaged when mastering a mechanic than they are when learning that the mechanic exists in the first place. Tarani also offers a couple trial and error supers. Her level 3 super massively heals the team, but only if you accidentally figure out that the puddles she spawns from her normal attacks grow the super's range or size. Tarani's level 2 super absolutely befuddled me. She melts into a puddle and I was so overwhelmingly confused that I never tried it again. Indivisible's big brain begins to show when the characters Lilani, Kushi, Phoebe, and Jan don't offer any supers at all, and even more characters only offer one super. You don't have to convey or clarify the content to the player if the content doesn't exist. However, the lack of transparency in Indivisible's supers scratches the surface of the total lack of information available to the player. 
Despite the misleading name, the character information snippets rarely provide information. Some characters lack so much transparency or information that they hardly exist. Tungar and Kadira's character infos provide very broad and surface level overviews. Tungar is some type of area damage character, but other characters like Rosmi and Bowzai contain powerful area attacks, so how does Tungar stand out from the rest? Kadira's follow-up attack gimmick sounds like Ajna, and since Ajna is a forced permanent party member and Kadira lacks any useful character information, I lack the motivation to ever consider Kadira. Ironically enough, the main character Ajna lacks a character info moveset or guide altogether, and she's more complicated than most other characters because her attacks change whenever she picks up new weapons during the story. Ajna is initially a steep learning curve because of her missing moveset information. Yan and Naga Rider's character infos are a single copy and pasted sentence. The game's party system offers three available character slots in a game with 21 playable characters. The characters must at least pique my interest to compete for one of the three available slots. Is Yan and Naga Rider actually as shallow and boring as their character infos make them out to be, or do they offer hidden mechanics and depth that I may not discover because the character infos are so barren. Numa's neutral attack deals less damage than her up attack and does nothing else, despite the unique wood effect afflicted on the enemy. Because Numa's character info neglects neutral attack and I can't finagle anything out of it, I'm left to assume it's an unfinished mechanic. In fact, Yan, Naga Rider, and Numa are not transparent because they are a few of the game's unfinished or shallow characters. The character info should be transparent about the dead weight characters so we don't waste time on them, or just remove them from the game entirely. A few characters display much more information in their character infos, but the lack of transparency in details forces players to tiresomely learn vital yet mysterious information. Players may tediously and methodically experiment to fill out as many details as possible before they're capable of judging the characters or investing time to master them. For example, Baozai's neutral attack steals coins which enhance her other attacks, but by how much? How many coins can she hold? How many coins are burned per attack? Jinsen's neutral attack boosts her healing power, but by how much? Is the boost good for only one heal? How much boost can she hold? Thankfully, Jensen's green bubbles indicate that the boost is good for one heal, but the bubbles only provide a rough indication of the max boost she can hold. Only the concrete number is useful, and that requires tedious trial and error. In order to even begin mastering Baozai and Jensen's mechanics, the player must slowly learn these vital yet classified details. However, a couple of the characters provide enough information for us to grasp an understanding and thus experiment with and invest in their mechanics. For example, Tarani's character info conveys quite a unique character, how she operates, and what we should expect. We grasp and understand her mechanics enough to aspire to master her playstyle. Even then, I misunderstood her puddle mechanic because of the lack of transparency. I thought activating the puddles dissolved them right away regardless if they affected a target or not. I didn't understand the character until I stumbled across activated puddles that remained on the field. Also, I believe the puddles have an arbitrary limit because they sometimes disappear, but after 30 hours in the game, I'm still uncertain. Unfortunately, that's a significant enough detail where the lack of transparency overall killed my enjoyment of the character and was an oppressive gate preventing me from mastering her. The lack of transparency is only one of Indivisible's several crippling detrimental problems, but it's by far the first to crush my motivation to play the game. As your understanding rises, hopefully so does your motivation, but you'll quit long before the difficult and frustrating learning process pays off, if it ever does. Transparency should also manifest in difficulty systems. Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order's difficulty selection includes bars that measure parry timing, incoming damage, and enemy aggression. Fallen Order clarifies what exactly changes between the difficulties, and that transparency is fantastic. But what do the bars mean or entail? 
Jedi Master halves the parry timing from story mode, but the distinction is relative and therefore meaningless unless we know not only how many seconds parries last, but how the parry mechanic feels during gameplay. Incoming damage and enemy aggression suffer from the same issue. What's the incoming damage relative to my health pool? How does enemy aggression scale? What does enemy aggression mean in the context of the game? Is there a higher chance of projectiles hitting? Will multiple enemies swarm me at once? Is the combat more engaging when certain enemy types benefit from higher enemy aggression? What content does this game contain that's affected and how? Fallen Order's difficulty options are absolutely worthless, unhelpful, and ineffective without context. Difficulty selection screens ask the player to make an arbitrary choice, which will affect how the entire game handles for them with no knowledge of how their skill stacks up against the game's mechanics. Frostpunk is the perfect example of transparency in difficulty systems and how the transparency only matters with context or experience with the game's mechanics and systems. Frostpunk skips the difficulty selection altogether on the first playthrough. Once you get the hang of the strategy and mechanics of the game, then the higher difficulties may provide a more satisfying challenge, or maybe I want an easier time or to mix and match the difficulty options. The default difficulty is now a baseline that I can reference when determining difficulty settings or individual options. Games should skip the initial difficulty selection screen and instead, at most, provide a means to change difficulty settings either mid playthrough or post playthrough. If possible, however, players should choose their own difficulty dynamically. In racing games, players don't choose the difficulty of paths on a given racetrack from a menu, whether easy wide paths or narrow winding ones. Instead, all of the paths are accessible at once, but the more difficult paths act as shortcuts. They're more difficult or high risk, but high reward. In the Dishonored series, the more difficult and risky pacifist methods for dispatching guards and mission targets reward an overall more positive outcome and effect on the world around you. You can instead kill your targets for a less difficult time, but the people around you will react accordingly. No better than these traitors. That's why I'm gonna tell them you're coming. Whether revealed through difficulty options, mechanic or moveset descriptions, UI, feedback, or controls, a game's information should be discernible and intelligible. Games that embrace transparency and clarity in their rules and mechanics are defined by the aphorism, easy to learn, difficult to master. Games like Nova Drift, Hyper Light Drifter, and Into the Breach allow and enable the player to engage in the gameplay because of the transparency in descriptions and visuals. We freely navigate and platform in ahead in time using the entirety of the available moveset because the controls are both transparent and intuitive. Some of Mario Odyssey's controls are intuitive, like jump, but some are woefully unintuitive and sometimes they contradict the player's intentions. Moreover, Odyssey doesn't include every control in the information it provides. As far as I'm concerned, undisclosed controls are not part of the game. Indivisible results in a confusing and frustrating learning curve thanks to the lack of transparency in character information and mechanics. However, if we look at the bright side, the initial steep learning curve will ward off players before they realize the game doesn't contain mastery or depth. Difficulty settings are unhelpful and ineffective without context. Frostpunk's effective solution establishes a baseline difficulty through gameplay that the player can refer to when changing difficulties mid or post playthrough depending on the game. Ideally, the player should be curious and driven to master a game through the depth of its mechanics and by a seamless and intuitive learning process, all of which culminates in satisfying experimentation and total proficiency. The initial learning experience should be transparent, engaging, and intuitive, but also brief. After all, you have learned something when you can do it right, you are a master in it when you can't do it wrong. Transparent, 